Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to Dead Reckoning Radio. I am your host, Jay Friesen. We are live. And to my left is the grieving UNC alum, Hadley A. Heath. <laughs> and to her left is the still smarting from his tax bill, Dr. Brian yeah. Matson. <laughs> oh, it wasn't too bad this year, actually. This is the April edition, uh, April 7th edition of Dead Reckoning Radio, where the three of us will intelligently engage with our culture's critical moments from a distinctly Christian perspective. First and foremost, to those of you joining us on our live stream, thank you for being here. Your banter is always enjoyable. Secondly, thank you to our sponsor, Alliance Defending Freedom. Defending your right to freely live out your faith, whatever that faith may be. ADF is daily in the court systems, taking up the fight for religious freedom, sanctity of life, and a marriage. So support their work. Visit them on the web at www.adflegal.org. And to stay in loop on the latest issues. Today's show, guys, is going to be a good one. We're talking about... If you do say so yourself. If I do say so myself. We're talking about heretical Hillary's pro-abortion gaffe. Pornography, that's always fun. Yeah, I knew you'd like that topic, specifically Jay. Specifically Time Magazine's <laughs> latest cover story, and of all things, Star Wars. Yes, Disney, the movies, and the death of artistic originality. Sound intriguing? Sounds intriguing. As always, we will have two rousing games of wit and whimsy. I think it's just wit. It's not like wit. I mean, there's no, there's no H in wit, is there, Hadley? Grammarian? No, there's so. no H. So it's just, it's wit and whimsy. Wit and whimsy. Do I need to turn off your microphone? <laughs> no. <laughs> Jay, you should just, you should say whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Ryan Who's Matt. Who's your daddy? <laughs> Who's a? Who's a? Hadley, it was a buzzer beater. Oh. Villanova <laughs> defeated the Tar Heels with a last millisecond three-pointer to win the 2016 NCAA title. But, yeah. but, but, the backboard but, was Hadley, red. Hadley, Hadley, <laughs> but before you comment, let's have a moment of silence. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> hey, I'm wearing my Tar Heels colors today. Oh, thank you, In Brian. Solidarity, In solidarity with you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was tough. That's hard to watch, you know. Um, at least it wasn't Duke, you know. We can look at the bright side. That, at least oh, we didn't you know it's bad. Duke. You know it's bad when your bright side is. At least it wasn't Duke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, but at least it was a team that you know. I feel like they earned it. Villanova is just exceptional. Uh, I was glad to see so many of the Villanova players giving credit to God after the game. That's always encouraging to see young men um, public about their faith. You know, I honestly, I'm I'm happy that we lost the way we did instead of losing by 10 or 20 points because there was a point during that game if you watched that it looked like the Tar Heels might go down by double digits yeah. and it's it's so heartbreaking to watch a buzzer beater like that but if you're a basketball fan you know you've seen it happen before you know it can happen even when we tied the game with seconds to go, I knew that there was a chance that that would happen, and it did. And in college basketball, in the tournament, it seems to happen more frequently than even ordinarily in basketball. I mean, there's something about the tempo of those games and the the parity. The teams are so seem to always be so evenly matched that that's why there's just buzzer beaters a lot in the tourney. Um, right. I just can't go for Villanova because they're located in Philadelphia, and you all know how I feel about Philadelphia. You despise so. Philadelphia. Yeah. So, Brian, um, speaking of Philadelphia, how about those Phillies? It was baseball's opening day, man. <gasps> we can move from basketball. And next up, I'm going to talk about ML soccer. No, hey, I'm look, kidding. I'm look, kidding. look, yeah. the, the void is over. You know, those, those, those months between the last out – of the World Series and the first pitch of opening day. I just call the void. I mean, I wish those months didn't even exist on our calendar. Um, so instead of playing 210 games, they play 460. I, I just, let's just shorten the year to 162 days. You know, that's, you know, that'd be my way of going about it. I love baseball. I am delighted that the season is underway again. It's it's springtime. The sun is out. The grass is green. It's cut. There's this, you know, even though I'm not there at the ballpark, I'm watching on TV and I can smell the grass I and the leather and the wood. Um, it's, it's just, it's a glorious game. 
of um, boredom. Law. No boredom. It is a glorious game. Somebody once said boredom. very wisely, "Baseball's boring until it's not, and when it's not, it's it's remarkable." So, here's what I'm really rejoicing in. <laughs> so I'm it's not boring rejoicing all the in, time. No, it's spectacular. I'm rejoicing in this. Um, I've been a baseball fan my whole life. There was a there's about a decade period in college and stuff where I kind of lost a little interest. Um, and I've been waiting as a father for a very long time for any of my children to care about baseball. <laughs> and I've always put them on my lap. And um, I mean, my eldest daughter's fourth word was baseball. Um, but she, my kids just don't care. They've never taken an interest. So here's what I'm rejoicing in. My team is 0-2. However, last night, my eldest daughter got back from youth group, came into my room, climbed onto my bed with me, and sat riveted watching the last three innings of the game last night. And for the very first time in the ninth inning, when we had the tying run on and two outs with Maurer at the plate, she was gripping her hands very tightly, and she felt it. She felt it for the first time. Wow, this is really exciting. And so, of course, what happened is Maurer worked a full count, as he always does, and then he struck out, and the game was over, and she was utterly deflated. But I think she's addicted. See, I'm just a proud father. That's it. <coughs> I, Yay Remley, for baseball Remley, season. make a note not to put Major League Baseball in the, op- in the quick takes, because it's a long take when Brian got It was a monologue that I feel deeply, and I had to get out, okay? So give, but cut, it, cut me some slack. Poetically, <laughs> it poetically reflected the sport of baseball. In the fact it sort of did. Kind of, I was getting bored. It was bored, boring, winded, <laughs> and <laughs> took a long time. I quit. <laughs> I quit. I'm out of here. You guys do the show without me. <laughs> uh, closer to home because the Tar Heels are over there and the nearest Major League Baseball team is in Denver. Here in the Big Sky Country, Montana, Chief Joseph Medicine Crow passed away last week at the age of 102. He was a legend. Um, and we felt that you, our audience, should know about him. So, Brian. <clears throat> yes. Why should we know about this man? Chief Chief Joseph mm-hmm. Medicine Crow. Well, he's 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 really uh, a true blue American hero. Uh, he's a Native American uh, um, Crow in Crow Indian, and he is the last living person to have orally heard reports about the Battle of the Little Bighorn, in which uh, Custer's last Custer's stand. Custer's last stand. His his step grandfather was actually a scout for George Armstrong Custer. Uh, Chief Medicine Crow. Was a uh, was the official Crow historian, tribal historian, and anthropologist. He was awarded three honorary doctorates. He was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest uh, civilian honor the United States of America can bestow on somebody. Uh, and he was the last uh, war chief, uh, last Plains Indian war chief, because he went to uh, war in World War II. And he was a scout for the 103rd, 103rd Infantry Division. When he went into battle, he put his war paint on underneath his uniform and, and, his, and his eagle feather underneath his helmet. And he succeeded in, in all four exploits that a war chief must do in order to be, to be a, an Indian war chief. And so those would be, hmm. those would be. Um, he had to touch an enemy without killing him. He had to lead a successful uh, uh, raid. He had to steal an enemy's horse. Believe it or not, he and some guys stole fifty horses from an SS battalion. And he, as he rode off, whooping and hollering, he was singing a, a crow honor song. So anyway, he got all the all of the coup that are needed to be an Indian war chief. And, and he passed away here in Billings, Montana, on April 3rd at the ripe age of 102. Fascinating. You know, they Isn't had a, that cool? They, they had a picture of him uh, in our local newspaper. Billings is the largest town in uh, Montana. Montana. And our local newspaper was a front-page picture of Chief Joseph Medicine Crow getting the, uh, getting the medal pinned on him by President Obama. Mm-hmm. Okay, what was with the photo? I didn't. I don't know okay. what you're referring. You have because to explain the photo, it to me. the photo it was it was him, a cute little old man, Indian man in a cowboy hat, yep. getting a medal pin on. Obama in the meantime is in the background like this. 
<laughs> well, you know, <laughs> the photographer just caught him at a bad moment. It was like one of those. <laughs> you know how you go click? I mean, what? It, click, and you just <laughs> caught somebody the, looking is, weird. Is that the best photo they can come up with out of all the photos? That's the only. And, you know, you could chalk that up pain. to. You could chalk that up to it's a, it's a Montana newspaper trying to put Obama in an unflattering light, except that the Billings <laughs> Gazette just, loves Barack Obama. I, I, I would just do like, that. what in the world is going on? Okay. Uh, quick takes. You know, Star Wars was on the quick takes, but we saved it for an entire segment, and I'm not because it's interesting. So, uh, anyway, so <clears throat> guys, and Hadley, I'll let you kick off this conversation. It is no secret that Hillary Clinton's presidential fortunes are teetering as Senator Bernie Sanders continues to clobber her in the primary events. This week, she did not help her cause, though, when she called human beings not yet unborn persons. Her usually reliable pro-abortion constituency collectively gasped. Did she just say persons? Oh, my. Well, it's well known uh, that pro-abortion advocates insist on using the proper euphemisms. Fetus is okay. Child is not. And under no (laughs) circumstances is person to be used. And perhaps, guys, the best way to frame our conversation is to quote the entire sentence by Mrs. Clinton. The unborn person doesn't have constitutional rights. Yes. Um, Hadley, will this faux pas really hurt her politically? Or is she already done? I don't, yeah, maybe I don't that's think the so. question. I mean, is she done? Clinton is, Clinton is usually so scripted. I mean, this is very... I think it's out of character for her to uh, go off message by using the wrong terminology for her pro-choice uh, following, I thought it was impressive that she managed to tick off both pro-life and pro-choice people at the same time, just weeks after Donald Trump had basically done the same thing. I mean, Donald <laughs> Trump also managed to tick off both groups uh, by saying something completely different. Um, but yeah, she so she said unborn person, and then she continued in her answer to talk about, you know, we want to do everything for a mother who's carrying a child to make sure that child is healthy. And I was thinking, well, now we're carrying children. Like, that's even, you know, person. Yeah, that's a sympathetic being. But, but children. children. Child. That's yeah. like the most sympathetic of all beings. And, um, and Clinton has really made, uh, you know, a forefront part of her campaign, the work that she's done on behalf of women and families and children. She talks about those groups of people a lot. So it struck me as just really bizarre that she would make this kind of misstep with her language. Um, But it also, you know, kind of reminds me of the scene when uh, Dorothy and uh, the rest of the gang in The Wizard of Oz find out that the wizard is behind the curtain and he's just pulling on a bunch of levers. You know, it's like, Clinton and, and the pro-choice people want to pull the curtain back now, like, oh, don't look, no, what the person, no, we didn't yeah. mean that, you know, yeah, right. don't look at what, what's behind the curtain, don't look at what's behind the, you know, what's inside the womb. The euphemisms, the, That's, the euphemisms, right. don't notice that euphemisms are euphemisms, right? Yeah, don't notice that we actually accidentally said something that's more accurate and more true than uh, than what we usually say about the subject. But uh, moving on, you know, nothing to see here. <laughs> I think that's sort of the, the response from the pro-choice side. And that's why it won't hurt her politically. Um, they, they know. It, it, it's, it just sort of reminds me of when Barack Obama was running for president and adamantly claimed that he believed in traditional marriage and was not for same-sex marriage. Um, the people on the left knew that that was utterly disingenuous. He didn't mean that, right? I mean, they knew he's one of us, right? There is no chance anybody on the left or in the pro-choice constituency hears a sentence like that Mm -hmm. from Hillary Clinton and has even a moment's thought, maybe she's not one of us, okay? I mean, they know. They know her convictions on this this issue. but it was a revealing moment, and it, it shows, I think it illustrates how difficult it is to keep the euphemisms up. You know, the more, the more we know, the more ultrasound technology is there, the more scientific, you know, scientific knowledge and information we have, it, it becomes increasingly difficult to keep up the act. Especially, as you point out, Hadley, that when she wants to... She wants to show herself as being very loving and caring to women and children. You just run into the, the, 
abortion's the elephant in the room. How do you yeah. talk about caring for children and in the same breath or in the next breath start talking about abortion? Uh, it's it's yeah. a rock and hard place, but it never seems to bother them. Well, what about the substance, you guys? What should we make of the questions of personhood, constitutional pr- protections, and a few other things? I mean, Brian, you brought up a good contradiction. How are they doing it? And Well, it, it, she has to walk back the personhood thing because the way the logic works is if an unborn child is a person— then it's entitled to to constitutional protections. That's that's, you know, personhood is language of of dignity. Um, a person is is uh, entitled to the protection of our laws, and that's why they've always avoided that language. They've always avoided uh, uh, describing the unborn in 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 human terms. Because they want to avoid the logic that it would then be entitled to protection under the law. So she's going to have to walk that back. And I just say that, you know, we have to continue to press it. No, this is a human person. And as such, is is created by God with intrinsic value and dignity and must have the protection of our laws. So it is the sentence in and of itself, you know, they person is not entitled to constitutional protections is quite a remarkable sentence especially especially coming from somebody who has been railing for years and years and years that prisoners in Guantanamo Bay are subject to constitutional protections okay so just by virtue of being human people uh, uh, in our in our custody so Make up your mind, are persons subject to constitutional protection or not? Right. And I'm speaking about this topic as somebody who's 24 weeks pregnant, you know, so this is personal to me, but this is definitely a person. You know, I can control all kinds of my bodily functions, but I can't control when this other being in my belly kicks me. You know, I have no control over that. That's a completely different person from the person of Hadley. So I think it, you know, on a very personal level, I wonder about Clinton and others who are pro-choice and who are mothers themselves, because they had to go through this experience that I'm going through right now. You know, I think the science is on the pro-life side, but you don't have to be a scientist to know that this is a person. And to quote, Horton, the elephant from Dr. Seuss, a person's a person, no matter how small. (laughs) So, you know, (laughs) it's a very, the logic, the logic here is very simple. Children can understand this. It's in children's books. You know, a person is a person, um, no matter any of the differences that we see between us and other people, because this is where it sort of does have, I think, a parallel, the, the, the life issue does have a parallel to the civil rights issue, because there have been people throughout history who have tried to make other people out to be less than persons less than deserving of all the constitutional rights and protections of other people right and when you start to draw lines among people and say well these people are people and those people are less than then you've got a problem you've got inequality you've got something that is not just and that's not right and so yeah i mean there's no doubt in my mind that unborn persons are persons i just think for the left the the question is and the problem is is always face them is where do you draw the line? You know, because if you're not going to say that all unborn babies are human persons, then where do you, where do you draw the line? Is it because uh, one child is wanted and another is not? That's such a subjective, philosophically su- subjective arbitrary subjective place, exactly. And and do you say based on uh, the, the functionality or the gestational age? I mean, are we really going to talk about age and ability when we divide? people into groups that are more deserving of rights than other people. I mean, we have a lot of people outside of the womb who have various ages and abilities, you know, so there's, to me, there's no, there's no justification to me about where to draw the line during a pregnancy and say, well, some unborn fetuses are persons and Mm -hmm. some are not. I mean, it just doesn't fly. Logically, I, I don't know how they can answer the question. You're hitting on a, on a crucial point, is, is the philosophical arbitrariness of it. Um, how, on what basis do we distinguish what's, what's a person and what is not? 
And that's why theologically, this is a theological conviction. As a theologian, I'm just totally unafraid to say it, even though supposedly you're not supposed to say theological things in the public square because it's not allowed, but I'm, I'm just going to say it. The minute you divorce humanity from person, you are completely arbitrary, you are subjective, and that is the, that is the ideological move behind all genocides in human history is I've separated humanity from personhood. Yeah, you can be human, but not a person with a capital P. You're subhuman. It's always that division. And that's what we have playing out here, is the divorce between humanity and personhood. And there's no rational, philosophical, or theological basis for that divorce. All humanity is created in the image and likeness of God. Period. Full stop entitled to life, entitled to the protection of our laws. That's, that's, that's a theological position that happens to be consistent and not arbitrary. Those who disagree with it are going to have to argue their case. Why are we always on the defensive? That's what's happening in our culture. We're the extremists here. <laughs> and no, we're not. You're the extremist. You justify your position. Yeah, I mean, do you think that this... Uh faux pas that Clinton has made is evidence that the language of the pro-life movement is so pervasive that she couldn't help but sort of pick up on on the terminology that is, I believe, closer to the truth and, and closer to accurately describing what is happening during pregnancy. I mean, I sort of see this as a win that she Said she it. stepped in it, right. <laughs> but I don't... She's, she stepped in the right stuff, you know? I don't think it's I don't think it's uh it's an indication that pro life language is necessarily winning. I think it's an indication that you cannot consistently at all times deny the truth. The truth will win out. And you can try to rebel against the way the world really is. You can try to rebel against reality. You can call it a fetus. You can call it a clump of cells. You can do that all, all the time with every breath, but you can't do it forever and you can't do it consistently because reality is it's a person. And it's a slip of the tongue that shows, well, it shows our humanity. We know, we know the truth. God has written this into the code of the universe. He's written it in our hearts. We know it to be true. We can suppress it, but we can never do that consistently. The well, truth it's, wins. It's good to know that Hillary is at least human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's not a robot? No, not a robot. You know, another reason I don't think this is going to impact her political campaign very much is that aside from how this issue relates to the Supreme Court and filling the gaping hole left by Justice Scalia, I really don't feel that the life issue has gotten that much traction in this cycle because we've heard, you know, the overwhelming majority of people who are responding to exit polls are saying that national security, terrorism, the economy, jobs, even health care, income inequality, environmental issues, these are all coming in Higher. ahead of the life issue in terms of what people see as the most pressing or the most important. And I don't think that's because uh, people don't see the, the moral weight of the abortion issue, but because they don't see a lot of change possible in our policies right now. Well, you bring up an interesting point, even on um, the, you know, in the evangelical uh, uh, voting block even a lot of evangelicals are no longer just putting abortion at the top of, of their lists, although I will say they're, they're related issues. Religious liberty tends to be the number one issue for evangelical leaders, at least as, you know, as we see in the World Magazine evangelical leader poll that they, that they put out. Religious liberty is a big, a, a big issue, but also they've, they've, they've gotten more tactical. The abortion issue gets lumped into the Supreme Court question. Because I know that among evangelicals, Supreme Court nominations are a very high priority. And that's, that's, they're expressing abortion as the issue through the issue of the Supreme Court. So, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I just don't really, I don't even see the, I mean, I, I hear about the Supreme Court from other people who are really tuned in. 
but I don't see it showing up on exit polls a lot. And I don't know if people just don't think of the Supreme Court as an issue unto itself. It is this right, cycle, yeah, it is. but uh, may not be top of mind for voters when they're answering that question. I think it's sort of, like you said, the Supreme Court issue is really a proxy for several issues that we feel, and, and I think this is true, they're tied up at the court. We can't change policy without changing some case law precedent. Right, right. So it's um, get somebody good to nominate the next Supreme Court justice. <clears throat> Watching those votes. But we're not talking politics today, are we? No, we're not really actually talking politics. That was actually, that was an abortion segment. It was. It was. That was the closest we're going to get to talking about politics. In case you missed it, uh, for those of you watching and listening, um, David DeLayden had his computers um, and footage all seized by the California government this week. Yeah, I did not get a chance to read that article, Jay. Can you explain to me... The what was this a what criminal justice agency did this? I mean, uh, who 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 did this? They were the attorney state general's of, no, office. No, the state of something. the state of California, along with uh, what I what I believe would be state patrol. A search I warrant? I don't know. They there was there were hardly any specifics. Hardly any specifics. And in fact, the they wouldn't even California wouldn't even talk about it. But. Crazy. The the other the other point made in the article is he's already cooperating with investigative agencies. Like there was really no like precedent for this other than. Who well, knows? I saw something about how they they had taken a bunch of footage, like pretty pretty important footage. Yeah, you know from him. I I assume he's got that backed up somewhere. Oh, he's got it. All he backed up seems somewhere. pretty smart. <laughs> I don't think he'd keep it all in one. He's place. all got it backed up somewhere. All right. When we come back, speaking of not talking about politics, let's talk about pornography and Time Magazine. Their article entitled Porn and the Threat to Virility. But first, friends, it's Yay! our favorite time of day. Yeah. Right, so nerd versus nerd. This game is simple. Remley, our producer, comes up with a term or a phrase off of the internets. And then I tell you what it is. And you give a definition. Okay. And whoever gets closest wins. So this one was a little bit difficult because there were two really, really good ones. Okay. Um, and I might have to tell you what the other one was that I didn't choose just because it was funny. Okay. Um, but anyway. Uh, this you ready, one is Hadley? Are you ready? You ready for this? Are you geared up? I'm ready. I mean, you? I feel like lately Brian's been stomping me. I think your perception is <laughs> off. I don't think it's the baby. <laughs> it's being pregnant. It's still perception. I don't know. Um, guys, the word today for nerd versus nerd is head desk. Head desk? Head desk. Isn't that just like face palm? Except for instead of face palming, you put your head on your desk. Is that it's your like guess? A well, that's expression exactly, of that's exactly what exasperation. That's exactly what I was going to say. I thought, yeah, head well, desk. I said it first. Like, well, no, I will let you have this one. <laughs> I'll let you have that guess. Uh, yeah, I was thinking like so. Jay's acting like I'm wrong, though. Well, I'm going to make like, another. Oh, I'm going to make a different guess, but I like your. So that? what you're saying, well, you're, Hadley, you're, what you're, you're saying is. You're for my opinion. Isn't that what it is? Well, I'm not going to tell you if it is or isn't because that's the point of the game. So what you're saying is, is when Donald Trump speaks and I go like this. I do that almost every show when that's we talk a head about desk. Donald Trump. That's a head desk. Okay, I'm gonna go with something else. I gotta come up with something better. It is, um, it is a special desk. It is a special desk that is made for. Listen, are you gonna let me? Excuse me. You gonna let me? Can, can I go now? Sorry. Okay. It's a special desk created for sports memorabilia aficionados to put in the corner of a room. To house all of their bobblehead dolls. Yeah, what's the name of that company that like head something or other? And they make those giant stand-up cardboard things. Well, I don't know, but this is for bobblehead Fat dolls. Fat heads. Fat heads. Yeah, this is for bobblehead <clears throat> dolls for sports memorabilia collectors who go to baseball games and they like to collect bobbleheads of all of their favorite players. Uh, is, so a head desk is a desk for bobblehead dolls. Okay. My reaction to Brian's definition is hashtag head desk. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well played. Well played. Well played. But you went for the real guess. I went for the balderdash edition. <laughs> Hadley, Hadley guessed it. Hadley had it right. Hadley that was my initial guys, instinct. Too. Guys, have you? Um, but I have, gave it to you. you heard... I gave it to you. It was my guess too. Sore loser. You gotta buzz in fast. It's like it's like Jeopardy. Sore loser. You gotta hit the buzzer really fast. Um, <laughs> have you guys heard of the term asshole? Say it again. Asshole. Oh, so no, like A S S C something. I have a no. guess for that. A S K H O L E. No, I haven't. You should haven't. We, should we guess it? Should yeah, we play another round? This is. This hey, is, everybody, should we play another Brian, round? Brian, would you like to go nerd? first? <laughs> it's called Ashcole. 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 I liked this one too. Uh, uh, man, wow. This is the double edition of Nerd versus Nerd because I have some bad news to bring you guys about next week. Next two oh, weeks. okay. So we're doing a double edition. Mm-hmm. Ask double edition. Um, Ask Cole. It is the name of the chief vampire in Stephanie Meyer's <laughs> twi- latest Twilight series book. Ask Cole. His name is Ask Cole, and he's he's really sinister, Ask-Cole. and he likes to suck blood. He's a really evil. No, actually, not a lot of I... evil vampires in the Stephanie Meyer. So, I, I think that's my answer. One Ask Cole. Ah ah ah. Do ask all. Ah, ah, Shut up, Count, ah. Count Dracula. Um, I'm just going to go with what seems like the most logical answer to me, and that is uh, it's a term used to describe someone who's um, acting like a... Like a you-know-what. You know mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, they're doing so by asking leading questions or annoying questions... Um, so you could call them an asshole. That's, you're going to win again, I think. That's really, that's Clo- really close. close enough? That's, it no. might be close enough. All right, well, tell the us actual the definition, is. according to Remley, is uh, an individual who asks ridiculous, obnoxious, or irrelevant questions... And it, it it's often chronic behavior. So this is kind of like... Well, she wins. That's, that's it. My, she's no, exactly what she's This at. is my five-year-old. My five-year-old is an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Hey. There you go, hey, honey. Remley. Remley, big shout out to you. Thank you for the kudos yeah. on the live stream saying I would win a Balderdash edition of this. Listen, when I don't actually have any idea what the real thing is, I just revert to Balderdash. He's quite funny. I just revert to Balderdash. Um, and the bad news, guys, is we are not going to be around for the next two weeks. This is the last show for two weeks. Um, there are um, technical reasons for that. Well, yeah. Next week, I'm I'm uh, I'm putting into service a new computer, and so we need some I need some time to basically shut down the studio. Guys, when he listen, listen, I I just want people to understand that when Jay says I am putting in a new computer, he does not mean like you know little desktop box. He has a computer that is like this big. I mean, I'm holding my arms all the way up. <laughs> and that high and it has how many cores in it? Like it's got 16. like 16 quad core processors in it. It's it's gigantic. So when we say no, it's we're got just, 16 processors, two 8 core, dual 8 core processors. Okay. So, 16 so total when cores. I say when he says we're putting in a new computer, I want you to understand th- th- this is a bigger deal than than it seems. So that's sort well, of one of the technical. We have a lot of te- you got a lot of testing to I do. I got some testing of... to do, and we got to move this whole rack right here that I was pointing to because it just gets really hot in the studio yeah. with all that gear. And then the, the week after is the cool part, though. Yes, the week after is the cool part where Brian and Hadley and I. Oh wait, Hadley's not going. Sad face. Oh, sad face. Sad face. Brian head and desk. I head desk. Him. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna be using that one this whole episode. Head desk. Uh, Brian and I are emceeing the Christian Leadership Alliance conference in Dallas. So if you happen to be there, um, come by Absolutely. and say hi. We will have Remley will be there. Yep. We will Red Foots on Films. We'll be have we'll have a booth and we'll be there to hang out and talk about we got, we'll Dead have Reckoning. Sh- we'll have some swag. We'll have swag. We got all new shirts and shirts hats coming. Shirts and hats and it's yeah. gonna be great. stickers. We got stickers coming. Uh, it's gonna be fantastic. So we'll be in in Dallas at the at CLA the Outcomes 2016 conference uh, one week from Monday. Yeah. So. so you guys want to be there if you can. If you don't live anywhere near Dallas, then I'm sorry. But that that's just that's it. Just now, a- we do have Brian, tell him about the special Dead Reckoning interview we're going to be posting next week though. 
yeah, so we're not um, leaving you content high and dry. We are not leaving you content free. So next week we are not having uh, an episode of Dead Reckoning Radio. We are doing a Dead Reckoning special uh, special interview presentation. Um, we are hosting an interview. Uh, we've already done it, as a matter of fact. We filmed uh, an interview with Larry Alex Taunton about his new book, The Faith of Christopher Hitchens. Um, I wrote a review on the Gospel Coalition uh, about the book. I read a, 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 an, an advanced copy and think it's one of the best books I've read in years. Um, I gave it a very, well, I gave it awfully high marks. Um, My wife read it in one Easter trip to Spokane. Yeah, I, I read it in one sitting. It was just it's an amazing book. Larry comes in studio, in this very studio. He sits right there where sits Hadley, right there usually, where Hadley usually is. And we talk about the book. It's it's a very, very enlightening, interesting interview. And so that'll be a special Dead Reckoning presentation. And we will have that for you I next think week. We're gonna have it. We're gonna have show. it for you on Monday, it looks like. Yeah, the <clears> book <throat> comes out technically Tuesday. So I think, Tuesday. The I think we're gonna put interview the, will yeah, come yeah, out Monday. Monday. Yeah, I'm gonna put it up Monday. So that's what's happening. <clears throat> Thanks for sitting through our shameless content plugs and party plugs and a, and two rounds of Nerd versus Nerd. Back to the topic at hand. Time Magazine's latest cover story is an eye-opener that makes you want to close them again. <laughs> Entitled Porn and the Threat to Virility. It documents that many younger people, the generation that has grown up with easy access to online pornography, believe that it has damaged them. To be sure, we are in uncharted sexual waters, never having before have people had unrelenting and uninhibited access to hardcore video pornography. It's everywhere. But now young men steeped in this world for their entire adult lives are finding actual intimacy a bit uh, awkward. Yeah, that's what the, that's what the article says. Um, awkward. awkward. Time understands the threat as one to virility. A, quote, public health crisis. Denny Burke and Russell Moore, however, each had outstanding essays responding to this, and they essentially argue that the vocabulary masks a deeper problem. We no longer think of sex in moral terms at all. So I want to I want to frame this issue in three ways as you guys talk about it. There's the cultural problems. There's the political problems and the theological problems that are all kind of brought to light here. Wrapped up. So who wants to uh, who wants to kick off the conversation on sex and porn? You're pregnant. Maybe you should talk about it. Since <laughs> what does that have most, to do with it? Most obviously, no one of it. Nothing. The Everyone knows that I've had sex. Sex equals right? sex equals pregnancy. <laughs> Head desk. Yeah. Head desk. Yeah. Can't keep it a secret anymore. Like yeah. Uh, sorry, I was too easy. Uh, I like the part in, uh, there's this movie um, where uh, Brittany Murphy is acting alongside Ashton Kutcher and they get married and she starts crying and uh, and she said, you know, you're going to deflower me. And uh, he says, well, I already know you're not a virgin. She says, I know, but now my parents are going to know, you know, because <laughs> like, we're married. <laughs> I was like, oh. when you're pregnant, like, <laughs> it's, yeah. over. Even if it's you, over. Even if your parents want to deny that, like, you know, married people Which have ties sex. into the first segment. Everyone knows. I was just thinking, you get an abortion, just, nobody will know. I was just thinking that sort of sheds yeah. light on that conversation Mary had with Joseph. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Must have been a tough uh, one. <laughs> yeah. That was a tough but conversation. But I'm still a virgin. I yeah, promise. I yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, man. Well, culturally speaking, I mean, I just um, porn, you know, let's pretend like we didn't have this introduction of this topic. I would say it's pretty evident to a lot of people in my generation that we're having a big, bad breakdown in like man woman relationships, uh, dating and um, marriage and family formation are really hard. And I think part of the reason they have become hard for people in my generation uh, is in part due to the porn industry and the way that um, it's so pervasive because it creates, I think, unrealistic expectations about sex. And it also um, sort of separates sex from intimacy, which uh, Russell Moore wrote about in his right. response. But um, without getting too much into the political and theological, I just think from a cultural perspective, I mean, it's causing a lot of hurt in uh, relationships and causing a lot of strain and struggle even in the in the first stages of relationships because 
if you have sort of replaced the um, sex that you usually have with another person with a computer or a magazine or something that is not a human, not a person, mm -hmm. uh, then you don't have the same desire to seek that out in another person. And so I think that's, that's part of the problem with man-woman relationships. And, um, of course, we don't want people sort of seeking out um, the same shallow level of sexual satisfaction by using other people. <laughs> right. Because um, there's a way to be promiscuous and sexually immoral and shallow in a way that doesn't involve porn. Mm -hmm. But certainly porn goes in that category of here's a, a human effort to replace one of God's greatest gifts with something shallow uh, and it results in a lot of shame and a lot of hurt. And that's what makes me sad. Maybe I'm saying that as a woman because I um, haven't had the experience of really even feeling tempted by pornography, but I know, you know, I, I can imagine more easily what it would be like to have a partner who says to me, I struggle with this. You know, it would make me feel so insufficient as a woman. And I think another part of the cultural question here and this is a question for you guys so everybody knows obscenity when they see it right but uh porn <laughs> do we know porn when we see it because i think we know hardcore porn but there are other things that i think that's kind of pornographic right. you mm -hmm. know like scenes in movies or sure. um maybe the sports illustrated swimsuit edition you know there's Abercrombie a lot of things and that Fitch i think kind of like yeah, and it's a slippery slope, and I and I know, you know, you can't avoid seeing certain things that mm -hmm. come on TV or, you know, my parents didn't let me watch PG-13 movies until I turned 13, so I was pretty sheltered as a kid, protected from a lot of this stuff, but mm -hmm. on the other hand, I think even for Christians and for people who are trying to live upstanding and, and right lives, there's a lot of stuff that I think is in this category of maybe it's not pornographic, but... It's not completely safe either, sure, you know. Sure. And so, mm -hmm. I guess my question on that is like, how do we define what's porn? Oh, wow! <laughs> what do you do this to me? Do is that too hard to of a me? question? <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I think. But it's, I think it's important because know, people is, who are trying to avoid porn, look, what important. are they trying to avoid? It's it's easy enough to not go to a triple X website, right? But, Right. It's is, that, is that the end of it? It's important, but it's also, I believe, a downstream question. Um, because as you began this whole discussion, you were pointing out, do, is, is porn porn when we know it, right? I mean, you know obscenity when you see it. Is porn porn when you know it? We have an epidemic right now in our culture of real porn. Porn that everybody knows is porn. And people are walking around... You know, kids have it on their handheld devices and on their tablets and on their computers, and they're exposing themselves to it all the time. So I, I would be like, it, it's sort of triage. What what should we really be worrying about right now? See, I don't think the problem in the church right now and even in the Christian community is a bunch of men who watched an R-rated movie that had a sex scene in it. I think the problem is the myriad of men sitting in the pews who have a real porn problem. And focusing on, hey, don't look at the cover of Cosmo this week, sort of misses the real crisis. Because I think that, the, the, that we're in a cultural crisis. I think that porn is pervasive. It's a massive problem in the church. And it's not, um, man, I saw, you know, uh, kind of a steamy scene in a movie. It's guys are accessing real porn and have real porn problems. Not to say your question's unimportant. Obviously, mm -hmm. anybody struggling with this has to draw some boundaries. They have to think through these things. What, what's attractive to me? What entices me to lust? And, you know, that's, that can be, that's probably going to not be a one-size-fits-all answer for everybody. Because, you know, what I think is a much more prevalent issue, both inside and outside of the church, for my generation and for the generations even younger than me, is uh, if you're girlfriend or boyfriend sends you a naked picture on their phone uh, is that porn yeah yeah it is of course so yes, that is if what about between a husband and wife is that porn no relational con context 
relational <laughs> context matters. <laughs> matters. Look, look okay. because listen. But I listen, think that these are important. I mean, nobody else is talking question. about this on their Christian podcast. You're right. Nobody's <laughs> no, talking think, about this. But I think it's kind of important because these are the kinds of things that can trip people up. Because if you start right. looking at pictures of your girlfriend's chest on a cell phone, she just sent you the one picture. It's just her. It's just. It's not like a stranger you yeah, care about right. her. Well, then, then it's like, well, what about this other chest that happened to be on the internet? And what about when it's moving and it's in a video? Or you know, so it's, I you're, think it is a problem. And you're bringing up a wonderful, wonderful point that 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 really leads into the heart of the issue. God designed sex for relationship. It's for the the, the relational context of this uh, is absolutely essential. Um, you asked me a question about a boyfriend or a girlfriend sexting pictures to each other, and that's not a relational context that is covenantal. These two people are not married. There are no vows. There's no covenant there. They, their bodies have not, they have not given their bodies to one another as God would have them do in a covenant of marriage. And then you asked me a question about a married couple doing that, and I said, well, Look, I'm not recommending everybody do this, but is it mm-hmm. lawful? Would this be allowable? Well, mm-hmm. um, morally, that relational context uh, makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. There, there are there's this is the relational context in which sex, sex and should I, be. And I didn't mean to get us off topic here. I just feel like culturally, <laughs> the, the sexting thing is huge. Yeah. You know, culturally, like I don't even know if you guys know how big it is. Like, no, there's I whole, have no idea apps dedicated to making it easier to send photos that self-destruct right after you send them right. so that snapchat i mean news. unfortunately a lot of young people are using this to do sexting and i think if we're not talking about it at the church then people young people aren't hearing the guidance and you know this was a really hard word for me as a young person because i would always be the kid in youth group asking like well is this okay is it is it okay if you put this arm around me is it okay if we snuggle is it okay if we you know lie down together and there were all these questions that i had about where to draw the line right as right, a dating right, right, right. teenager and dating young person and um, the hard word f- for me at that time was when people would say, and this is the truth, you're asking the wrong questions. The Bible says whatever is pure, whatever is noble, whatever is good, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. You mm-hmm. know, flee from sexual immorality. Don't toy with it. Run in the opposite direction. I didn't want that. I wanted to know how far could I go and still be. Right. In God's good gra- in God's good graces, you know, yeah. and that I could still be legal and lawful and and not disobedient, you know. But my heart was already in the wrong place because I was asking right. those questions, right? You know, but um, that's hard. And I think there's, you know, I think it is still valuable to talk about why we think certain things are acceptable or not acceptable. And I think the relational context that you're talking about is everything. I mean, it doesn't matter. The med- the medium doesn't make it porn, but the context makes it. Porn. And Is that and what it's I'm it's it's well and, and and there's more than it's more than a two way relationship, okay? Because yes, it's a husband and wife, but you can't leave out the ultimate relationship, and the ultimate relationship is God. It's God, husband, and wife. It's it's how, are you conducting yourself in a way that is honoring and pleasing to God? You can't leave God out of the analysis. And I'm glad you brought up the whole thing with teenagers. You know, how far can I go? What's you know, where's the line? Holiness, faithfulness is not a line. Holiness and faithfulness is a direction. It's what am I oriented to? What are all of what's what's animating all of my actions? That's faithfulness. That's holiness. It's not a line. If you're saying, "Well, I'm going to go this far and no further," you're already out of the realm of of faithfulness and holiness, right? So there's right. a lot of things involved. It's relational context between husband and wife, God, husband and wife, and and being faithful and and, and holy in all of your dealings with each other. Uh, toward God as a, as a direction. So, but Hadley, I don't think it's off topic at all because you know you're everything that we're kind of touching on here is is what is fr- you know framed by this by this article and and brought up by the by the Burke and Moore articles that that it's we have spent so much time demoralizing sex that it becomes nothing but a pleasurable thing to do. So se- sexting a photo of <clears throat> your dick or whatever to your girlfriend <laughs> is about as is about as entertaining and pleasurable as as grabbing a beer with your buddy. I mean that's kind of the level it's brought no, down to. There's right. no 
you've you've demoralized it so it's nothing but nothing but an act and so it's just rampant and to me that speaks a little to the culture i mean they've been trying to do that since i mean everybody cites the sexual revolution of the 70s but that's like where that's like sex is not is not a, a big deal sex is not a big deal and then you sit down and watch a show where everybody's having sex with everybody right. else name your series and all of a sudden, it's a big deal when he finally gets to have sex with the girl he likes. How does this work? Yeah, that's interesting. This doesn't work at all. What this makes it? All. What makes it? Yeah. What makes that one special? Oh. But I would encourage my our viewers. Our viewers, um, we're going to put up the links to Denny Burke and Russell Moore's uh, commentary on this Time Magazine article because they really, really are worth uh, reading, and I think that. Um, I think it was Russell Moore, or no, Denny Burke made the point that the cultural problem here is that Time Magazine sees what's going on. We've desensitized all of the, this whole generation of young men from sexual intimacy, and they can only think of it in terms of a public health crisis. It's just a health, mm. it is a health crisis. What are we going to do about the health crisis? And he's saying, wow. That is so. Sh- it already gives away the game. It that itself treats sex so shallowly, to think it's all a, about public health. Um, and he makes the point: we've lost the moral context um, for this. And I'm not. You know, it's going to get worse before it gets better, because there's no political solution to this. There's no. What is the political solution to this? Outlaw you're gonna, pornography. You're gonna outlaw pornography. Good luck. But it's a, that's an action. It doesn't get to the heart issue. It doesn't get to the de- to the Brian. You you brought up the desires. The you know Hadley in your example. You were already there. You know your heart was already there. Yeah. Right. You're already there. You know you're not guiding and it. I know the I know the answer. Jesus is the answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> but Jesus. Jesus is the answer to our cultural problems. And remember, politics is downstream from culture. So it's the cultural issue that has to be tackled first. Well, it's not, a, and it can't be a taboo topic anymore. I mean, that's, that's one thing that's, that's evident. It's so prevalent in all of our lives, in every facet, either immorally or morally. Mm-hmm. It's so prevalent that it's still treated kind of as a taboo topic. You still have parents who are like, I don't know if I should talk to my kids about it. Well, guess who's talking to your kids about it? Other kids. Yeah. You know, and it's, yeah. it's tough. And it's tough. I don't. I haven't read the Time article, um, but my first thought was, you know, of course, of course, there are consequences. You know, of course, there's always consequence to sin. You know, I'm not surprised that the proof is in the pudding that porn is bad for people. You know, right. right. It's, but to me, I think it's it's kind of a good thing that a major publication is running a cover story about how it's not good for people. Right. Recognizing. I mean, of it, course. Right. Of course, it would be nice if everyone understood the moral implications of this on top of the public health implications. But I think it's a it's a good thing that there are people who are being outspoken about the consequences of pornography, because it's not just you know, we're not just trying to encourage people who share our religious faith and our worldview Mm -hmm. to avoid this stuff and, and who share our view of sexuality. But we want flourishing for all people we want all people to enjoy all the good things that life has to offer and so i you know i work at a secular organization we're not religious a lot of the issues that we talk about i think well here's how i got there as a christian from my worldview and my understanding of humanity and my understanding of human mm. nature and then there's another way to describe this issue without really mentioning or depending on a lot of my faith-based right. reasoning at least openly um, depending on and, and right and so i think that it's uh a part of me thinks it's a good thing though that we have um people who are, are spokespeople uh there's a movement against porn that is not really based on the moral right. conclusions that you and i might draw about sure. this i mean i think it's wrong to eschew those moral concerns but i think it's also <clears throat> possibly going to be helpful to be able to say, not only do I think this wrong, this is wrong, but I think it's going to be harmful to you. And here's how. And yeah. here's here's what the studies have shown. And here's what people who've experienced this have to say about it. I need to link it, but several years ago, the Art of Manliness ran an article on pornography, uh, a series of articles on pornography. That was really and linked, good. And linked to uh, 
a guy out in the UK who would wor- who was working for one of those you know Maxim like magazines. Those yeah. just this way of that was a great like, article. It was right. a fantastic mm-hmm. series. But this particular guy left his magazine um, specifically because he saw how much damage it was doing to other men. And he's like, I can't, I can't be a part of that. He wasn't a Christian, but he started doing study after study after study, and it was, it was just chock full of amazing yeah. details. And I'll try to dig up the link. But. I, I am, I, I like you, Hadley. I, I think, I, your, your point is really well taken that we should be encouraged at some level that time is running this story. There are people who, you know, may not share our moral convictions who are taking note of the scourge of pornography and its, and its effects in our culture. And we should not, you know, turn up our nose. You know, don't look a gift horse right. in the mouth. Hey, these right. could be some allies for us. Um, that's a that's a point that's that's well taken. But I wonder, I just wonder what comes next because, I I mean, to me, pornography, and the 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 sexual freedom that it represents, is the flower of the sexual revolution. And I want to sit down with these people and say. If 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 you were lied to about this, right? Pure sexual freedom is going to liberate us to peace and happiness and love and joy. If you were if that lie resulted in this conclusion, what else is the sexual revolution wrong about? And what are the implications going to be? It's going to be an interesting conversation. I I, I have a feeling that. All of us are going to be having this conversation for the rest of our lives because it's going to take that long for this, these cultural issues to play out. Right. And I know the Time article is about porn users, um, but none of this is, is even to mention yeah, the producer. effects of porn on the industry itself and the actors and the stars of mm-hmm. these materials. I mean, I watched a short documentary one time on a, a young woman who was a student at Duke University. And she started making money by doing pornographic videos. Right. And she starred in several movies. Her name is her, her screen name is Bell Knox. And um, I wouldn't really even recommend this documentary to our audience. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody because it just haunts me. It just yeah. haunts me to to know what she went through. I mean, there's one scene. It just breaks my heart. It makes me want to cry. You can imagine. These two young women have just filmed a scene together. Two women. Mm-hmm. And um, after they've done their pornographic taping, they get in a car together, a town car, presumably to drive them to the airport or back to wherever they have to go. And they're fully clothed, and they get in the back seat of this car together, and they're just chatting. It's so awkward because they've just yeah, basically you know, had sex with each other. And... Uh, the one girl says to the other, do you believe in God? Wow. That was hard. That was hard to watch. <laughs> wow. It was hard to watch because the heartbreak, you know, like what kind of self-worth do these people feel? You know, Look, I, know? It, it, there, it, it, this story never ends well. I mean, isn't, I mean, show me the great success stories of uh, people involved in the industry who led full, you know, flourishing, happy lives. It's uh, it, it maybe maybe you can find a few needles in the haystack or <laughs> a few few bright spots in the wreckage and the ash heap of that industry. Um, these people are used and abused and t- l- tossed out. Well, the they're <coughs> when they're done, the a, a sliver a sliver of hope for the industry as a whole is that. It's kind of killing itself. It's so prominent and so free that they can't make any money on it. Well, that it's it's just incredible. Irony it, sort of the, thing. It, it's kind of just eating itself. Yeah, it's 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 an example of how sin's consequences are its own judgment. God judges sin often by just the pure natural consequences of of something. And so porn, the problem with porn has been too successful. <laughs> okay. It's had so much success. Now suddenly they can't even, they can't make any money on it. It's just ring. Playboy. Like Playboy. Playboy, Playboy is a right. perfect example. Yeah. yeah. Playboy helped launch the porn industry and now has to stop printing porn because there's no market for it anymore. You know, victim of its own success. Um, anyway, it's, it's encouraging that, that the effects of this industry on young men is being talked about in the public square, and uh, we should 
you're right, Jay. Um, sh- just, this shouldn't be a taboo subject. People should talk about it. You should. And the good news is there's nothing so dark that Christ can't save you from it. You know, that's, there's nothing so dark. I mean, I just think like, oh, the people who've been abused and mm. used and the people who have uh, just run themselves through the muck with this stuff, you know, there's nothing so low. There's no sin so great that God doesn't or, forgive. Or the spouse or the spouse whose partner's completely uninterested because they're, uh, immer- you know, neck deep in, in the porn world, the, the neglect right. that one must feel be, being unloved. Um, this is this is something that's troubled a lot of marriages. And look, um, some of Jesus' uh, dearest followers were people who were deeply involved in sexual dysfunction, um, prostitutes. Uh, you know, Whole books written on the topic. Uh, sluts, you know, re- go, read, go read John 4, you know, the, the woman looking for, looking for love in all the wrong places. These were Jesus's, Jesus was so tender and so loving to these people. Um, think about the church in Corinth, um, city renowned for being a culture exactly like ours, only their pornography was on the open street outside the the, the, the pagan temples uh, with temple prostitutes. Um, surely there were many Christians in the church in Corinth who came out of precisely what what we would you know the porn industry of their day. Um, all of which is to say this is actually not new. Jesus has the resources to deal with precisely this kind of problem, this, this uh, rending asunder of the way God made things, and Jesus is in the process of putting it back together. It's a good word. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about, we're going to move on from something really, really heavy and really crazy to Star Wars <clears throat> and art. Um, Entertainment, but, but first, fun. but first, in another complete swing from actually talking about sex in the open sphere, we're gonna have a game revolving around Christian movies. Oh man, so gonna I'm gonna lose one. this one. Go for it. It's gonna be great. Shin, you guys, this is really easy. <laughs> Rotten movies. It's based around Rotten Tomatoes, and uh, if you guys know what rotten, if you guys don't know what Rotten Tomatoes are. Um, you're not on the internet much, but the tomato meter rating based on published opinions and hundreds of film and television critics is a trusted measurement of movie and TV programming quality for millions of moviegoers. It represents the percentage of professional critic reviews that are positive for a given film or television show. So this site, database site, collects reviews and adds them up and gives it a tomato score. Okay, it's either a rotten tomato or a freshly wonderful ripe tomato. You guys, the game is easy. I'm going to go down the list of movies, and you guys are going to tell me what you think the score was. You don't have to know anything about on the ro- movie. On Rotten Tomatoes? On Rotten the tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes score. So high number <clears throat> is lots of good tomatoes. Lots of good tomatoes. Low number. It's the rotten, stinky rotten, nastiness. Rotten, stinky movie. Yeah. And it's a scale of 1 to 100, right? Yep. Okay. It this is. is going to be really hard. So it's whoever right. gets the closer number wins here. Is that what we're going to do? Yeah, pretty much. All right, so here we go. Uh, fireproof. In an attempt to save his marriage, a firefighter uses a 40-day experiment known as the Love Dare. The Love Dare. Love Dare. 62. Okay. 48. Brian's closer. The number is 40. Oh, oh I like that movie. <laughs> <laughs> you admitted it. Uh, I love it. It's on film. We just broadcast it to the world. The Grace Card. Everything can change in an instant and take a lifetime to unravel. Um, that was the one about the the couple that had like gotten engaged or something, and then there was a car wreck, and then they got married. I don't know. No, that's oh. a different one. Okay. I'm gonna guess higher on this one, just higher than Fireproof, okay. because I think the audience was smaller. <laughs> so I think when the overall audience is smaller, then maybe there's a higher approval rating. So I'm gonna guess 62 again. Okay, so 62. What's the name of the movie again? <clears throat> the Grace Card. And so that's your that's your uh, yeah okay. So yeah. she went 62. Mm-hmm. Uh. 38. Brian's closer at 35. Ah, I am now, for the record, and I am close. Too. For the these record, close. That's, remember, Rotten Tomatoes, these are the critics' scores, okay? For the record, right. Hadley, oh. 81% of the audience liked the Grace card. 
Oh, I thought we were doing audience no, numbers. Uh, if you don't listen to the rules, then I don't have a lot of <laughs> sympathy right. for you. Woodlawn, a gifted high school football player, must learn to embrace his talent and his faith as he battles racial, racial tensions on and off the field. This was made by a college classmate of mine. I don't ever talk to him. We're friends on Facebook. But I'm going to say 45. See, Hadley's wrong about this one because I think this one did quite substantially better. I'm going to say 68%. Wow, Brian gets it again. 77. 77. All right, guys, end of the spear. You're getting slaughtered here, Hadley. End I of know, the spear. Two and people come to the end of a spear in order to realize that the divisions between them are not real. Okay, but this is not about the Elliots. No. What was the name? Didn't they make a movie about? Yeah, I think it was like the end of Spear. Through the Gates of Spelunder. Tip, tip, of the, tip of the Spear. Tip of the Spear or something like that. Okay, but. I'm just reading you the, the, the little log line. You're just reading us the log line, but if, I don't, if I'm totally unfamiliar with the movie, it's hard to guess. Just guess. Okay. End of the Spear, it's called? End of the Spear. What do you think, Ed? I'm going to go with 50%. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That is wise. 22%. Uh, Hadley got, gets it this time. 40%. Oh, yeah. 40%. Hashtag Team Hadley. Hashtag All right, guys. <laughs> All right, guys. Smell a comeback. <laughs> Megan, Megan right. is a t- You know, you have a, you got a fangirl. You do. We need, to make, we need to make Team Hadley t-shirts. Come on, show me it. some love, Megan. Man. Um... <laughs> We need some Team Hadley t-shirts. That'd, That'd be hilarious. so. That would be yeah. cool. I'd love that. Yeah, and your head Hadley. desking in the background. Yeah. That'd yeah. Be fun. All right. Uh, <laughs> courageous. When a tragedy strikes close to home, four police officers struggle with their faith and their roles as husbands and fathers. Together, they make a decision that will change all their lives. They decided to pray. No, that last part was mine. I'm just kidding. Oh. Uh, and they had a casting crown song on the soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Title track. How many of these do you watch, Hadley? <laughs> I love these movies. These like all the movies that came out of uh, somewhere in Georgia, yeah, Albany, the Georgia. Sherwood, Sherwood I Baptist. Loved <laughs> Sherwood Baptist. Did you watch Flywheel these? though? Did you watch Flywheel? See, I don't like no. any. I don't like any of these movies. But we see, can talk about that what? later in the next segment. Okay, correct. They're hallmark. They're hallmark say, movies. I'm gonna say. I'm gonna be hopeful. I'm gonna say 62. I'm just gonna say 53. <laughs> um. Brian's closer, but neither of you are even remotely close. 30%. <laughs> Whoa! That 30. one got horrible yeah. reviews. 30. Wow. All right, the ready? acting is... The, acting is, uh, the there last, was no Kirk Cameron in that the one. The last Sin Eater, in seeking her own redemption from the man of whom she's most afraid, 10-year-old ten, Katie Forbes discovers a secret sin haunting her community of Welsh immigrants in 1850s Appalachia. The Sin Eater? This last Sin Eater. That sounds creepy. The, the last Sin Eater. I'm going to say that one did well, and I'm going to go with 65%. I'm going to go with 64%. <laughs> You're learning how to play this game. <laughs> I know. Jason just tells you, Brian, to work on your strategy. I guess one point higher or lower than Hadley. Um, Hadley, you're closer. 19%. Yeah. 19? How bad could that movie be? <clears throat> All right. Ready? The Passion of the Christ. I don't oh, wow. need to even read this log line. No. Oh, how, what is it on Rotten Tomatoes? I know the critics. I mean, a lot of critics hated that movie, but it was not for cinematic reasons. Um, they really hated Mel Gibson, and they really hated... They they didn't like the content. So this is a tough one. I mean, in terms of movie making, it was extraordinary. It was really well done. But... I didn't see that Did one. The, I didn't see you didn't see one. The Passion of the Christ? It's only the highest grossing R-rated movie of all time. Really? Yeah. Uh, I think Deadpool just beat it. No, I don't think so. It's coming close. But it's not there yet. I don't think it's there yet. It's the highest, Deadpool's the highest rated comic book movie. Yeah. R-rated comic book. Um, now, quit um, talking about Passion it. Passion of the Christ. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm actually going to think that it's, it's actually rated pretty high. I'm going to say 83%. Okay. I'm going to say... 75%. Way to go, Hadley. 49%. Oh, okay. So sure. <laughs> I, it kind of evened out there after a little while, Hadley. Uh, I still well, think Jason I won. On the Jason on the live chat really helped me with my strategy. So thanks for being yeah. on Team Hadley, I saw, Jason. Listen, Jason, I saw, <laughs> I saw his, uh, his 
his recommendation, but I'm trying to pick it on the dot. All right, I we got, forget the, we got two know, more. Like we got two more. Oh, I thought we were two not. More. No, we got two oh, more. I hope Facing the Giants is one of them because I love Facing the Giants. Actually, it's not. <laughs> I don't have that one on Boo. here. Chariots of Fire. Uh, 98%. Wow. This 97%. Is... <laughs> She'll probably win. It's 96. Is Hashtag it? head desk. Is it, uh, is it 96? No, it's 83%. Hadley that gets really? that one. That's yeah. cool. I am shocked that that's only 83%. That is one of the greatest movies ever made. All right. Um, how about this one? This is one of the greatest movies ever made. The Omega Code. <laughs> Haven't seen that one. I haven't either. Two men with conflicting agendas each seek a prophetic cryptogram written on a page from a murdered rabbi's notebook. Sounds like the Da Vinci Code. It's called the Omega Code. This is the Christianized version of the Da Vinci Code. I don't know. It's called the Omega <laughs> Code. Hang on. Um, I'm going to just, I don't know. I think it's probably 15%. Okay. Hadley? I'm going to say 20. Oh, wow. This one. Whew. Come on. I haven't even heard of it. Who wins? It's a, it's a, it's a 1999 thriller okay. starring a bunch of people you've never heard. Um... <clears throat> Brian wins because it only got 8%. Wow. Is that like the worst rating on Rotten Tomatoes of any movie ever? Close. I don't know. I didn't even think that 15 was like statistically probable because it's so low. Yeah. Okay, guys, that's a good good lead into our final segment. The death of artistic quality. As you know, Star... If you don't know, you may not have known this. Star Wars just today released a trailer for a new movie. Rogue One, a Star Wars story. It foreshadows for us not a future of no, not X-Wing fighters and Imperial Starfleets, but a future of another Star Wars movie every single year for the next few decades. <laughs> decades. And Did, S, are guys, we sure we wanted decades. a reboot? Are we sure we wanted a reboot? Okay, now, speaking of reboots, let me give you a list of the films currently, and I'm not I'm not just trying to pick on 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 Disney right now, even though most of these are Disney movies, there's a few of them. Out. Okay, here's a list of what's currently on the slate right now, right? Indiana Jones, The mm-hmm. Jungle Book, Sleeping Beauty, The Little Mermaid, Tarzan, and how many more Spider Man remakes? I don't even know yet. <laughs> um, they're also, Hulk is coming back in another film, <sighs> and now Star Wars, as far as the eye can see. <sighs> it's kind of depressing. Our original idea is dead. Yes. Apparently nobody can come up with an original. Uh, only Christopher Nolan can come up with a, with an original idea. But even he's still building even off did, an old brand. And he did Batman. You know, Even he had to go dipping back into old, old material. Now, I, I want to bring up a point before I ask you guys um, <clears throat> actually a couple of opinion questions. But mo- um, uh, risk-taking. I think it comes down to some risk-taking. There's two elements of play here. Taking a risk and making a movie as a major studio. Movies cost so much money right now right. that they will completely go under. One one flop will sink them. One flop. Here's a couple. United Artists in 1980, have, they made Heaven's Gate. Okay, After that movie flopped, United Artists, the James Bond, like they went up for sale. Yeah, Heaven's Gate, and Heaven's Gate for a long time was, I believe, it was the largest box office Flop. For like 20, Forever. 30 years, it was um, the biggest flop. Carol Co. You probably have never heard of Carol Co., but they're the studio behind Basic Instinct, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, and the original Total Recall. Wow. Big movies. Guess what movie killed them? No idea. Cutthroat Island. What is Cutthroat Island? Exactly. It's the one with Gina Davis <laughs> and the, the pirate movie. You know, I kind of liked that movie. I liked that one, too. It was good. I liked that movie. It was good. It just I flopped, liked it. Though. It just completely flopped. So my, I have my, no idea what you guys are talking about. I just think... Hadley, it's because you're just too young to know all of these so. old movies. Hadley, are you burned out on sequelism yet? Do you want something original? I mean, is it really the case that we are experiencing more sequelism today than in times past? Yes, absolutely. Yes, that is because actually true. Let me tell you what movies we like to watch here at the Manning household. <laughs> okay. Lethal Weapon 1, Lethal Weapon 2, Lethal Weapon 3, <laughs> Lethal Weapon 4, 
Die Hard one, Die Hard two, Die Hard three, Die Hard. Good day to Die Hard, Die Hard, Die Hard. Okay, we were not saying that there were never any sequels. We're not Beverly saying Hills Cop sequel. One, Beverly Hills Cop Two, Beverly Hills Cop Three, Beverly Hills Cop Four. I'm detecting a, I'm detecting a particular genre era. Okay, genre. That, now that's so, a point well taken. That's a point well taken. <laughs> the problem is everything. Everything is really very sequelized now. I, I I'll tell you that when I was um, when I was a I don't know how old I was, but Airplane Two I thought was the funniest movie I had ever seen in my life. And my favorite scene in Airplane 2 is where the terrorist is in the airport. They're still in the beginning, and he's walking in uh, to, the, to the gift shop. And he walks into the gift shop, and he walks up to the counter and says, I'd like to buy a bomb. And the guy's like, okay, here. And he pulls that. The guy buys a bomb. Well, that's not what I thought was so funny. What was so funny is that in the background, you know, there's a whole wall of posters you could buy. And there was a poster... <laughs> that had an old, decrepit man, an old man wearing boxing gloves, boxing gloves, and it said Rocky, and then it had 38 in Roman numerals. Rocky 38. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was the whole, most hilarious thing ever. You know, I wonder if there's going to be an element of, of originality coming out, though, um, it, within within a particular sellable like franchise, like Star Wars. You know, okay. you you have Star Wars, you have the brand, the well-known brand, and then uh, and then you get original within that universe. It's kind of the world, the Star Wars universe now. And they're doing the same thing with Marvel. They're you know like Gar- Guardians of the Galaxy was incredibly original. I thought like super fun, mm-hmm. super original, and yet it's still a Marvel movie. It's still in the Marvel Studios movie. I guess the question that occurs to me is: Have we gotten to the point uh, economically? That economic success, the risk involved in making movies, um, is is stifling the imagination. Though, I mean, I just wonder how how free did J.J. Abrams feel in making a new Star Wars to deviate from expectations to to really shake things up. There's so much money at stake now, and executives mm-hmm. are so. You know, and everything's got to be screened and poll tested. I just wonder if, I, mean, I guess this is why the indie movie industry is doing well, is because that's where you have to go if you got an original idea. Or Amazon, right? Amazon and, uh, no. you know, Netflix. Hadley, what is it you like about, like, the courageous movies, the the fire draft or... God's Not yeah. Dead, God's Badger, Fireproof. Something. Yeah, that, those, yeah. That genre, the the, the, the pure flicks kind of faith... Right. Um, Faith-based. Do you movies. find them? Do you find them original, or do you just find them entertaining? Well, they're they're uplifting, you know. And I think that that's not just true of explicitly Christian movies. I think there's a lot of storylines that uh, reflect the gospel because there's a status quo and things are right, and then things are broken and messed up, and then things get redeemed. And things are right again. And that's basically how every fairy tale is. But I got so turned off by um, seeing so many movies that I thought were just like postmodern, didn't reflect the gospel, didn't have a lot of truth or um, uplifting content, left me feeling sad after watching them, you mm-hmm. know, right. that uh, when those movies... Um, I guess from the Starwood uh, group came into my life. It was at a point in my life too where I felt like um, God was really trying to get me to focus more on things that were right and good and uplifting. And so, I you know I think content like that in uh, in movies can be hard to find. At least I feel like there are so many movies that I think. I don't really want to watch that because that's just going to make me sad and depressed, you know. And I like hearing a story and walking away from the story thinking, I feel great about that. You know, mm-hmm. that's that was good. That was true. And that was, you know, that makes me feel hopeful and, and happy. It's Sherwood. <laughs> Is that too much to ask? No, 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 know? no, no. It's, <laughs> yeah. That brings up another question I have for Brian. It's Sherwood. It's the Sherwood films, not the Starwood. Starwood's yeah. the hotel. Oh, sorry. Oh, the hotel routine. <laughs> the hotel <laughs> chain. Listen, Brian, where, where you can stream Sherwood is there a movies. balance, Brian? Is there? A, we hardly ever talk about movies on this show, so I'm I just. I'm, it, yeah. Is there a balance between between? Sorry, 
how do we balance um, telling a good story and still kind of keeping in mind Philippians 4 8, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right? Think about these things. Well, look, yeah, I mean, look, Philippians, Philippians 4, whatever is pure and noble and right and, and true, it, that, those, that, that is a, a verse that is often, I think, quite, quite misused. Um, the Bible's true and it's noble and it's pure, and yet the Bible has horrific scenes of violence. It has horrific acts of wickedness and sin, and God actually expects us to read those things and to ponder them and to meditate on them and to consider them. Uh, go read Ezekiel chapter 16 sometimes. Uh, that'll be a little eye-opener for you. Um, that's, that's in the Bible. That's, that is God's depiction of, of what rebellion and sin looks like to him, and I'm not even going to repeat it for you. Um, <laughs> right now on our show. I won't even tell you what that's about. So so just, I, I think that people tr- use that true, noble, etc. to talk about kind of sanitized sentimental is good, pure, noble, and gritty and real is not those things. And that's where they're separating those things. I don't think that's mm-hmm. right at all. I think what is true and noble and virtuous is to look at the real world of brokenness and sin that we're in, to look at it honestly, look at it bracingly, and to portray it in the right context, um, and, and to tell the truth about it. And I think that can be done really well. And it doesn't, it's often done not even, well, Christians don't even do that. I mean, we want all, all uplifting, all sanitized. And, and very often unbelieving directors sometimes hit on truths about the world in more powerful ways than Christians do, precisely because I think that we're, we're dichotomizing in the wrong way. Does that make sense? I don't know, Hadley's head. Yeah. <clears throat> I see something working around in Hadley's head. I just, I well, just think... I, I, I don't want to put Brian on the spot, but I want to ask, like, what yes, are some you examples do. you think of, like, movies that have been made recently that are gritty and real and that are also um, telling the truth that, that or, also or, pointing, the truth about or some, pointing, pointing to some to redemption. Yeah. I'd have to, well, yeah, that's putting me on the spot. I am um, putting you on the spot. And you're I, mean, that's, me, I was trying to think of some myself, you know. And, and you're I, asking me like, um, yeah, recently. Well, I don't know. I, I totally agree yeah. with you, though, when you say, I mean, there, there were people raving about the movie American Beauty, which won uh, a Best Picture at the Oscars, Kevin Spacey. That uh, is two and a half hours of my life I cannot ever yeah. get back. That was the worst, most nihilistic, empty, uh, redemptionless film I've ever seen. And I know Christians were like, oh, it was so deep and profound. So I'm with you on this, Hadley. Like, yeah. That's crap, okay? Don't, don't give me that. Um, but I know that there are examples of, of great films with great themes that often point in, in wonderful redemptive directions that I think are very useful. I just wish that Christians wouldn't sanitize the world so much. The Bible doesn't sanitize the world. God doesn't sanitize it. Um, he exposes evil for what it really is and offers this, a solution that is not, is not a veneer. It gets down into the nitty gritty rock bottom of our sin and our and our brokenness and our dysfunction, and I I think Christians lack imagination of how you can portray that in film. So the truth I, I liked I liked the movie Gladiator. That's one that sort of comes to mind. That's like it was not a Christian movie. Well, not, what, well, what well, themes not, not did you like in that, though? I liked that the character who is the protagonist is, um, he is about something greater than himself. Revenge. And he does, <laughs> yeah. Look, revenge, wants, films, revenge films point us to the thirst for justice, <laughs> don't they? I think that's telling the truth. There was a theme, and I don't want to hijack Hadley's thing, but no, there, was a, I did. there was I a theme did. that I, I loved. It's when he stands there and he goes, are you not entertained? I love that. Yeah. I, yeah. Feel like, I feel like there's, it's talking about American culture right now. Yeah. Yeah. We, don't want, we don't want truth, justice, and all that. Yeah. We want to be entertained. We're so self-centered. We just want to be entertained. 
Okay, Hadley Cohen. What you, you were talking but about. I mean, he's 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 loyal to his men. He's loyal to his family. He wants to do what's right for Rome. You know, he has principles, and he does what he thinks is is right, acting in accordance with his principles. And he's the celebrated hero of that movie. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I guess I like movies that have some reflection upon my worldview and what I believe to be right. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a Christian story. Right. But um, it could be one, like you said, that is gritty and real. And, uh, you know, of course, like characters in films, I don't care if they're Christian films or not. They're not, you know, I'll give you, uh, they're I'll, not all perfect. There's, there's, yeah. you know, some uh, heroes have flaws too. Um Except for Jesus, of course. But, you know, but. But, uh, look, historically, <laughs> Christian films, the hero's flaws are pretty mundane. Yeah, like I they've mean, got a problem with drinking. Yeah. Or I, they oh, lose their a, temper. A, yeah, he drinks or he smokes and he... It's not that gritty. Listen, I'll tell you bar. a movie. I'll tell you a movie. Um, the Machinist. Oh, that movie's good. Go watch The Machinist. The Machinist... Um, what is it? Uh, what's, what is this psalm? I'm thinking off the top of my head. Uh, Psalm 30, is it 32, where he says, uh, when I kept silent, my bones were wasting away until until I confessed, right? Mm -hmm. That movie is about guilt and confession and repentance. And it's Christian Bale, who like lost 100 pounds to play this role. He's a skeleton. Mm. And it is gripping, it is gritty, and it is absolutely powerful. The power of of confession, the power of uh, of naming your sin, what it is. Now, did that end with you know he went to church and he heard the gospel and he got on his mm. knees and he repented? No, but that's where Christians always want to take the movie, and that's where I say no, 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 no. We're not doing evangelism here. We're doing a movie. We're doing art because it's bad evangelism, frankly. It, it, it is, and trust me, this movie is great where it where it stays it artistically and powerfully makes the point um so i guess i just keep saying that christians just i think we lack our we have bad bad theology about what our art should be doing um that said i don't hate all these movies i watched a movie called grace unplugged or something like that Mm -hmm. about the 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 girl you know who got tired of just singing church music and wanted to go be a rock star and all this and and i watched that with my eldest well now you can be a rock star and sing church music yeah it's true. But I, I mean, I watched that with my eldest daughter because I thought it made a point that was particularly important for her at that exact time in her life. And that was the importance of owning your faith for yourself and not just because your parents uh, own your faith. And I felt like that movie was a really it was a really good tool for that very limited purpose. Um as a mo- it doesn't have a lot of appeal beyond that very, for me beyond the very limited purpose and and I don't necessarily want to look at all movies like they're just tools you know I think it's a challenge we'll close out the conversation here but I think it's a challenge for um anyone to compete with something that's really creative um and yet still kind of be on on some of the same budget as I mean, you're not going to be able to compete with these big budget films. Right. So you almost you have to rely on your artistic, you know, the the subsection of of people. I think they're going to watch something just because it has a great message, is small. I mean, these aren't unless it's you want to make enough, a sermon. It's big enough for them to keep making movies. All right, God's Not Dead Two is coming out, and that's because Pure Flix and this 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 group has figured out we've got our constituency. All right, and they made forty four so million dollars then. on let the first one. Let me recommend this then, and they're going to do. Let me recommend one. this then. Don't compete with Pure Flix. Either work with them, or go out and do something that's creative and and, and compete with some of the some of the non Christians out there and see if you can make better art. Okay. I don't know if there are a lot of moviegoers out there like me, but I think more than my desire to. Well, of course, I like I like things that reflect my worldview and my values and point to what I think is truthful and right. But more than even more than that, I want to avoid the movies that I think are trash and the mm-hmm. movies that I think are going to point people in the wrong direction. Sometimes the movies that I put in the trash category are not what you might think. They're not necessarily R-rated. They're, they don't have 
Mm-hmm. Pornographic sex scenes are bad language, but they're movies, I think, with a bad message. And there's nothing that ticks me off like watching a movie with a terrible message with a bunch of my young friends and thinking, they're all going home with this stuff. You know, like <laughs> the, stories, <laughs> the stories that we listen to and the stories that we tell as a culture are very important. Stories impact people. We carry stories with us. That's why there's so many stories in the Bible. That's why Jesus taught so many lessons through parable. Stories are so important. And when I hear a story that's got it all messed up, I just want to shake my friends that I watch the movie with and be like, this is not true. I love <laughs> you know? it. So, so that- I don't like stories that, that sort of have a, a piece of propaganda or, or a lie in them at the heart of them and you can see both you can watch you can watch stories on both sides of the aisle well what i was going to say about that though i mean i i that With I, I totally appreciate that hadley but even those stories provide you opportunities to say look at this message this message is is bad here's a better message right i mean i it, even that can be can be viewed profitably even by you, yeah. to identify what is the message here. And if I talk to somebody who is imbibing in this story, how could I say, you know, mm-hmm. there's a right. better way, there's a better message. <clears throat> right. And, and thank you, God, for not making reality like this movie. Yeah. <laughs> thank you that those yeah. things aren't true. Yeah, there you go. A lot of I, rom-coms. I, I will always remember, Had- <laughs> I always remember Hadley on one show we were talking about, um, I think we were talking about this, some of the, one of those, like, dating apps and how difficult relationships are these days and you were like i like my boring kind of boring married boring. life here in denver <laughs> yeah, <I do. laughs> so, it was fun that. um yeah and people need a dead reckoning so share us with your friends share us with everybody you know post us up on facebook and everything else they need a fixed point of orientation and speaking of fixed points of orientation don't forget to stay in in tune for next week's interview with Larry Larry Alex Taunton about his book, The Faith of Christopher Hitchens. Um, We are going to be gone, as I mentioned, the next two weeks. Um, So we'll miss you guys. Um, Send us a note or a letter. If you're going to be in Dallas, uh, come to the CLA CLA conference and uh, we'll be emceeing there and otherwise we'll be hanging out in the exhibit hall and uh, hamming it up and chatting with folks. And maybe you can even win a shirt or hat or three. So that said, um, Hadley and Brian, where can people go to find out more about you two kids when uh, over the next two weeks when we're not around? Well, same places you can always find me, uh, drbrianmatson.com, drbrianmatson.com. I'm at Twitter at Brian G. Matson, and a public, public Facebook page at Dr. Brian G. Matson. You can find me shopping for maternity clothes since my waistline keeps getting bigger. Good thing you can't <laughs> see on the on the live stream. Um, but seriously, you can find me on Twitter at Hadley Heath. Or uh, if you want to follow some of my professional work with IWF, that's the Independent Women's Forum. They're online at iwf.org. But my usual disclaimer, I don't speak for them on Dead Reckoning. I just speak for myself. And uh, if you're going to tweet at me, use hashtag Team Hadley. So I know that you're on my team. <laughs> oh, That's on, fantastic. Yeah. If you want to follow uh, Dead Reckoning on our social media, you can subscribe to the website, subscribe to the email, subscribe, and by website I mean the RSS feed to get blog updates. Subscribe to the email. You can follow us on Twitter at D Reckoning TV. You can follow us on Facebook at Dead Reckoning TV, and you can follow us on YouTube at Dead Reckoning TV. So it's all there um, to get notified. If you're listening to us on the podcast, and you're like, man, I think it'd be cool to jump online and ham it up with all those folks and interact with us. Um, please do. But to get notified of the next live stream, since we are volunteer and sometimes we do fluctuate our days because we've got other responsibilities, uh, although it usually falls on Thursday or Friday, um, subscribe to our email list or follow us on social media and kind of keep kindly keep in touch. If you do appreciate what we're doing, and you do want to see it continue, um, consider maybe becoming a donor and um, supporting us. You can do it digitally. It's tax deductible. All your contributions go directly to the show, or uh, we might send some money to Hadley just because we like her. Everybody likes Hadley. Uh, and to Team get the, Hadley! <coughs> to get the, Team Hadley! <laughs> we're going to spend some of your money to get Team Hadley shirts. Yes. <laughs> Um, you can make a donation online at deadreckoning.tv. Just click the donate button, the donate now. You can set up recurring. Um, we do appreciate the work. You kind of know what we're about. And um, you have two weeks now to catch up on all the episodes you might have missed. 
So that said, guys, I am uh, excited to close out the show for a little bit. So thanks to Alliance Defending Freedom for sponsoring today's episode, www.adflegal.org. They defend our right to freely live out our faith in the courts of America and the world, actually, now. But politics is downstream from culture, so we appreciate you here. So send a note to ADF. Thank them for supporting us in our fight in uh, culture to sway the minds of the youngins <laughs> and stuff. The youngins. Right. Thanks to Remley for producing the show. Hadley, thank you for joining us, Brian, and especially all you guys listening on the live stream and our subscribers to our podcast. You guys are amazing. Uh, I'm Jay Friesen. I'm Brian Matson. I'm Hadley Heath. And this has been another episode of Dead Reckoning Radio. <laughs>